what are the different types of studies out there and what do they mean? For example, you know, an observational study versus a, a randomized controlled study. What are the different types of studies? I think broadly speaking, you can break studies into three categories. Um, one would be observational studies. Um, and we'll, we'll bifurcate those or trifurcate those in a minute. Uh, then you can have experimental studies. And then you can have basically summations of and or reviews of and or analyses of studies of any type. So um, let's kind of start at the bottom of that pyramid. Um, and I, I think you actually have a figure that I don't like very much, but I, I was know going to say, yeah, that was one of your favorites. Yeah, I can't stand it. I, I'll tell you what I like <laughs> about the figure. I like the color schema because my boys are <laughs> so obsessed with rainbows that if I show them this figure, they're going to, they're going to be really happy. So let's, let's pull up said rainbow figure. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, uh, you can sort of see these, these, these buckets here. And, and again, at the, at the, at the level of kind of talking about them, I think this makes sense. What I don't agree with the pyramid for Bob is that it, it, puts a hierarchy in place that suggests a meta-analysis is better than a randomized control trial, uh, which is not necessarily true, but let, let's just kind of go through what each of these things mean. So, so looking at the observational studies, an individual case report is, uh, you know, look, I, the, I think the sec first or second paper I ever wrote in my life when I was in medical school was an individual case report. Um, it was a patient who had come into um, clinic. This was at, when I was at the NIH. And this was a patient with metastatic melanoma and their calcium was sky high, dangerously high, in fact. And obviously our first assumption was that this patient had uh, metastatic disease to their bone and that they were lysing bone and calcium was, was you know, leaching into their bloodstream. Turned out that wasn't the case at all. Um, it turned out they had something that had not been previously reported in patients with melanoma, which was they had developed this P, uh, uh, parathyroid hormone related like hormone uh, in response to their melanoma. So um, this is a hormone that exists normally, but it doesn't exist in this format. Um, and so their cancer was causing them to have more of this hormone that was causing them to uh, raise their calcium level. It was interesting because it had never been reported before in the literature. And so I wrote this up. This was an individual case report. Um, is there any value in that? Sure, there's some value in that. The next time a patient with melanoma shows up to clinic and their calcium is sky high and someone goes to the literature to search for it, they'll see that report and uh, you know it will hopefully save them time in getting to the diagnosis. So your mentor and friend, Steve Rosenberg, I think of him when I think of individual case reports where I think if you listen to the podcast, he talks about this, but a lot of what motivated him early on, I think, were were just a couple of a couple of cases, and it, I think, it gets back to that first question too about the process for a study to go to an idea to design to execution, which is to to have a hypothesis, you need to make an observation. Right. So you make an observation, you say, hmm, that's strange, and I think that that that's what individual case reports can represent sometimes. Is is this is a really this is an interesting observation? It's hypothesis generating for the most part, but it really it might kickstart uh, a larger trial or it might might kickstart a career. You never know. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, of course, it's not going to be generalizable, right? It's I can't make any statement about, um, you know, the frequency of this in the, the broader subset of patients. And obviously, I can't make any comment about any intervention that may or may not change the outcome of this. So that gets us to kind of our next thing, which is like a, a case series uh, or, or set of studies. So here you're basically doing the same sort of thing. Um, but, but in, in, in plural effectively. Um, so, so you, you wouldn't just look at one patient, you would say, well, um, you know, I've now been looking back at my clinical practice and I've had, you know, 27 patients over the last 40 years that have demonstrated this very unusual finding. And uh, another example of this, going back to the Steve Rosenberg case, would be 
uh, one could write a paper that looks at all spontaneous regressions of cancer. Well, there's obviously been a number of them. They're infrequent, um, in fact, they're exceedingly rare, but there are certainly enough of them that one could write uh, a case series. So, so now let's consider cohort studies. So, so cohort studies are larger studies, um, and they can be retrospective or they can be prospective. So I'll give you an example of both. So a, a retrospective observational cohort study would be like, let's go back and look at all the people who have used saunas for the last 10 years and um, look at how they're doing today relative to people who didn't use saunas over the last 10 years. So it's retrospective. We're looking backwards. It's observational. We're not we're not doing anything, right? We're not telling these people to do this or telling those people to do that. Um, and the hope when you do this is that you're going to see some sort of pattern. Undoubtedly, you will see a pattern. Of course, the question is, will you be able to establish causality in that pattern? Uh, cohort studies can just as easily, although more time consumingly, be prospective. So you could say, I want to follow people over the next five years, 10 years, who use saunas and compare them to a similar number of people who don't. And now in a forward looking fashion, <clears throat> we're going to be examining the other behaviors of these people and ultimately what their outcomes are. Do they have different rates of death, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, other metrics of health that we might be interested in? Again, we're not intervening. There's not an experiment per se, we're just observing, but now we're doing it as, mar as we march forward through time. Okay. So this brings us to the kind of the next layer of this pyramid, which are the experimental studies. Uh, and again, we sort of divide these into randomized versus non-randomized. And of course, this idea of randomization is going to um, be a very important one as we go through this. Uh, so a non-randomized trial uh, sometimes gets referred to as an open label trial where uh, you take two groups of people and you give one of them a treatment and you give the other one uh, either a placebo or a different treatment, but you don't randomize them. There's a reason that they're in that group. So you might say, um, you know, we want to study the effect of a certain antibiotic on a person that comes in the ER and we're going to take all the people that come in who look a certain way, maybe they have a certain, a fever of a certain level or a white blood cell count of a certain level, and we're going to give them the antibiotic. And the people who come in, but they don't have those exact signs or symptoms, we're going to not give an antibiotic to, and we're going to follow them. That's kind of a lame example. Um, you could do the same sort of thing with surgical interventions. We're going to try to ask the question is, surgery better than antibiotics for appendicitis or suspected appendicitis, but we don't randomize the people to the choice. There's some other factor that is going to determine whether or not we do that. And as you can see, that's going to have a lot of limitations because presumably there's a reason you're making that decision and that reason will undoubtedly introduce bias. So of course, the gold standard that we always talk about is a randomized control trial where whatever question you want to study, you study it, but you attempt to take all bias out of it by randomly assigning people into the treatment groups, the two or more treatment groups. Um, we'll talk about things like blinding later, because you can obviously get into more and more rigor when you do this. But before we leave the kind of experimental side, anything you want to add to that, Bob? Uh, I would add, so non-randomized controlled trials, maybe another example, I'm trying to think of another uh, example, which is you have patients maybe maybe making a decision beforehand, which we'll get into selection bias, but it, you, people might want to go, they might want to go on a statin, let's say, and then other, you give them a choice and the other ones might want to go on some other drug like azetamibe. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're basically selecting themselves into two groups, but you could, you could compare those two groups and see how they do. Um, but you haven't, it hasn't been randomized. There's a there's a lot of bias that can go into that. There could be a lot of reasons why one group is selecting a, a particular treatment over the other. And so that's why I think when we get to randomized trials, that it, it shows the power of randomization. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but let's we don't need to go back to the figure, but people might recall that at the top of that pyramid was you know systemic reviews and meta analyses. Let's just talk about meta analyses since they um, are, are probably the most powerful. So, so this is a statistical technique where you can combine data from multiple studies um, that are attempting to look at the same question, basically. So. Um, th- each study gets a relative weighting, um, and the weighting of a study is sort of a function of um, its precision. It depends a little bit on sample size, uh, other other events in the study. Larger studies, which have smaller standard errors, are given more weight than smaller studies with larger standard errors, for example. Um, a very common way that these, you'll, you'll, you'll know you're looking at a, a meta-analysis. We should have had a figure for this, but I, I'll describe it the best I can. They usually have a figure somewhere in there that will show kind of across rows all of the studies. So let's say there's 10 studies included in the meta-analysis. And then um, they'll have the hazard ratios for each of the studies. So they'll represent them usually as little triangles. So the the triangle will represent the 95% confidence interval of what the hazard ratio is, which we'll we'll talk about a hazard ratio, but it's it's basically a marker of the risk. And you'll see all 10 studies, and then they'll show you the final summation of them at the bottom, which of course you wouldn't be able to deduce looking at the figure, um, but it takes into account that mathematical weighting. So on the surface, meta-analyses seem really, really great, right? Because if one trial, one randomized trial is good, 10 must be better. Um, But again, and I I know I've said this before probably three or four times over the past few years on the podcast. Um, but as, as James Yang, one of the uh, smartest people I ever met when, when I was uh, both a student and fellow at NCI, uh, once said during a journal club about a meta-analysis that was being presented, he said something to the effect of, a thousand sow's ears makes not a pearl necklace. And you know that, that's just an eloquent way to say that garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you do a meta-analysis of a bunch of garbage studies, you get a garbage meta-analysis. So it, it can't... Uh, it can't clean garbage. Um, it, it simply can aggregate it. So a meta-analysis of great randomized control trials will produce a great meta-analysis. 